Hello and welcome back to the Widow podcast. It's lovely to have you joining us again. Today, I am really excited to be introducing you to the lovely Lisa. Um, I have met Lisa through Instagram, which has been wonderful. I've met many wonderful people through Instagram and Lisa's one of them. Um, She hasn't ever been a, a client of mine. We haven't worked together, but Lisa's positive outlook, her mindset, her story. She is incredibly inspiring and motivating. And I wanted her to come and share a little bit of her journey with you guys so that, you know, you can understand more about the things you can do to help yourself and hopefully draw some strength, some wisdom from Lisa and and maybe you know put some of the things that she's used through her journey into practice yourself um, to help you on on your grieving journey to create something meaningful after loss. So Lisa, hello. Hey, how are oh, you? I'm good. It's lovely to have you here. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time doing this. Okay. Bless you. So to start off, do you want to tell us a little bit about Sai, your your husband? Yeah. So we we uh yeah, we we've both had Simon, haven't we? We have, um, yes. And that was something I think that uh, drew me to you. Oh. Uh, because when you talk about your Simon, I think of my Simon as yeah. well. So yeah, my Simon um, was 34 when he died, uh, which was November 2019. Um, He had um, been diagnosed 13 months prior um, uh, with kidney cancer. And um, it it, at that stage, it was already terminal. It had already spread. to his spine and and his blood. He had numerous complications as well. He had like a um, a blood clot and and, and all sorts was happening when he was when he was diagnosed. He wasn't overly poorly when he was diagnosed, which made it quite a shock. Mm. Uh, Although he had kidney cancer on the day of diagnosis, he still had 100% kidney function uh, because the other kidney just, you know, made it all look okay so it was it was tricky to find it but we knew something was wrong for about about two or three months before but nothing that we thought would kill him because we don't you just don't think that um but prior to him being unwell he um was an incredible person i love talking about him um and uh we'd been married 10 years uh, two children, um, Miles and Edith. They are seven and four now. Um, but when he died, they were so Edith, it was three days before Edith's third birthday, and Miles was five. Um, and he he was a pastor at a church, um, and he'd uh, I met him while he was at Bible college um, through some mutual friends, and he just love of my life just completely met married him pretty pretty quickly uh, we're engaged um yeah we, we were married at 20 I think I was 23 he was 24 we grew up together completely just mm. completely um yeah literally just grew up grew up together what was um, it tell me what was it that kind of attracted you to him what did you sort of uh, love about him his his drive if anybody mm-hmm. knows Simon they knew that he is inc- was incredibly driven and mm-hmm. um, incredibly ambitious uh generous kind thoughtful um he knew what he wanted I loved that about him although at times it's driving me a little bit bad mm-hmm. but um he was very um yeah, just just high high capacity person is what we used to talk about. You know, he could, he could do a lot in very little amount of time. Um, he was really good at what he did, um, but incredibly personable as well. Caring, loving. Um, you know, had a massive heart for missions. He'd go to he'd go to um, Africa, Cambodia on different mission trips. Um, and just just had a mass just had such a big heart massive heart for raising money for charities 
Um, he was, like I say, he was a pastor at a church, so zeal for God mm. and, um, and Jesus and furthering the kingdom of God. He, mm -hmm. he, that, that was his, that was his life's passion mm -hmm. was to further the kingdom of God in wow. everything he did and everything he was incredibly loyal. Um, yeah, just, just amazing. I could, I could go on. But <laughs> He was one of life's good people. He really was. <laughs> yeah, well, he was one of a kind. One Aww, of a kind. he sounds wonderful. So wonderful. How did his his help his faith help him through through his illness? Did did he draw on that a lot? Yeah, he did. Mm. He did draw on that a lot, and um, and he 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 his relationship with God got stronger. Mm -hmm. In so many ways. I mean, he he, he was cross because he mm -hmm. was sick and he wanted to be well, but he never based being healed on the God was sovereign. Mm. It was all God is sovereign, and you know, if I get healed this side of heaven or that side of heaven, I'm healed. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, he, yeah, like when he was when he was diagnosed. They wanted to admit him into hospital straight away and he this was a friday night and he said uh, no <laughs> classic simon he said no sorry i've got to wake up in the morning and tell my kids that i'm gonna be gone for a few days and i also need to tell my church family on sunday Aww. um and on sunday he went and told and and told the church what was going on and then the sunday afternoon he was admitted and he stayed the week um you know, and he, yeah, he, he led the church through that time. We also had um, other pastors be involved and be, and support us. I mean, our, our, our support that we encountered in that year of him being unwell was astonishing through the mm. church community and through friends and family. Um, but just, you know, held in prayer, held practically, um, mm. just, just incredible, really. Mm. Mm, that is that's amazing I think you know when people have something a, a faith a belief something to to draw on it it, it gives them some strength doesn't it yeah. it um it, it certainly helps a lot of people in in many ways yeah. so obviously you had the diagnosis mm -hmm. and within that diagnosis you didn't believe it was going to be terminal um so what happened in 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 that sort of was it uh, was it about 13 months between diagnosis mm. and and side dying mm -hmm. um you know how how was that process how did you feel in that process what were your roles in that in in the caregiving side of things for Sai? what impact did that have on you what what was kind of showing up for you in terms of how you were feeling and how did you cope with with what was coming up for you you know that year i think about it a lot Mm. And I don't know how many memories I laid down, actually, because I think you're in such a highly anxious state. So Simon had a pulmonary embolism and went, so that's a massive blood clot. And when he was diagnosed on the Friday night, the, the doctor kind of just looked at him and said, can, can you stand up? Can you, can you show me your legs? Like, he just said, we, you know, they, they called us that Friday night phone call out of the blue. You need to come in now bring your parents, bring your wife, it's not good. So we knew it wasn't good. And when we got there and they said, you know, we, we, we need to get you on blood thinners straight away. You're, you are, might have a heart attack and, and die, or a stroke or die. Like we, we just need, to, that's why they wanted him admitted straight away. And he just, um, he just didn't see, he didn't seem that unwell. So it was just really odd. He'd been losing weight. Um, but he didn't seem that unwell. So it was quite, you know, it was a, it was a shock to the system, understandably. And I, I paused work at that time and I um, kind of threw, threw myself, I suppose, into, into just being here, being present, being around for the kids, being present for Si. He, Simon was back at work. And you know, three, three, four weeks after being hospital, he's like, I can't sit around, there's, there's stuff to do. I'm like, okay. <laughs> but 
it was pre-COVID, you know, as well. So we, we couldn't travel. We probably would have traveled if, if, um, if we could have done, but we, you know, we went away with the kids and we, um, we were just very acutely aware of making memories and living. So Simon was all about celebrating life. Mm. So we would every month of his diagnosis, so the second of every month, so he was diagnosed second of November, 2018, the second of every month, we had a cake and a candle on that said what how, like he'd lived another month, he'd lived another month, which was so lovely, but so painful. And so, so confusing for the kids. I think it turns away. That is mm. birthday again. I'm like, no, it's not, you know, but he lived, he lived again. And the team at the hospital were incredible, but they would, they said to us, we didn't, we didn't think you'd necessarily make Christmas. So we're really pleased you're here. Um, and Simon had a massive zeal for life. He wanted to live. He was cross, he was dying, but he, and he wanted to live. So he talked about celebrating life a lot into the church. He talked about that. And so, you know, we went to London Zoo for, um, we went on holiday a couple of times, you know, we, we'd make memories and make stuff happen. He was very, I want to make our 10 year anniversary. And we had a wonderful party for our 10 year anniversary. He wanted to see uh, Miles go to school. And, and that was incredible. Um, and that year in a way was kind of just a bit of a whirlwind. Like when I think back to it, I'm just like, how did I even survive that? Like, mm. that was me like mental time of my life, the craziest time of my life, really. Um, and I just functioned because I functioned, because I'm a high functioning person and kind of in a high state of stress and anxiety, I still can function, you know, quite well. I exercised through that time as well, which helped. And Simon encouraged me to do that. He was always like, you know, get yourself to the pool, get yourself to the pool. And he would worry about me, but I just was like, you know, you don't worry about me, I'll worry about you. You know, just mm. we kind of had a very team a team mentality to it, I suppose, which was how we'd done our marriage. So it wasn't, it wasn't unusual that we kind of, when he was diagnosed, it felt like I'd been diagnosed. Um, mm. You know, it was, it was, I was at every appointment, every chemo session, every blood transfusion, you know, I, I lived it with him. I would, you know, be as much, as much involved as I could be um, because he, he was me and I was him. Mm. So Mm. Um, did you did you talk to each other very honestly and openly about sort of how you were both feeling what you were expecting moving forwards what you wanted moving forwards I mean what were the conversations like as, as much as we could at mm. times it was just too painful um and there was a part of me that always wanted to believe that maybe he'd be healed so there would be a part of me that I was like, well, we don't need to talk about that much because, you know, this will be like an amazing miracle. Mm. Um, but he, he was incredibly grounded in his faith, you know, and would say, you know, he'd say things like, um, you know, this is not Jesus's fault. We, you know, I, do, I don't ever blame God for this, you mm. know. Um, and just, it, and, and equally, you know, he'd say to me, you know, you, you are going to be all right. You know, just to hear that was like, th okay, thank you. I need, I needed to hear that because you doubt everything. Did you believe it? Yeah. Yeah. Cause I believed him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I believed mm -hmm. him. And, mm. um, and, you know, he, 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 he was my biggest fan really. So he'd always kind of you know so I you know I, ma I married you because of who you are you mm. know and and the substance within you so you know it, when we you know when we'd met I'd like just come back from Brazil and he was like that's why I fell in love with you because you just had such a you know zest zest for life and you you know what you wanted to achieve and to see mm. so that that's who I fell in love with, that that person is still here today. Oh, that's you know? lovely. So, I mean, is, is there anything that since Psy died that you 
looked back and thought I wish we'd had this conversation or I wish I'd asked him that question you know from or were you quite accepting of you did what you did at the time because it felt right at the time yeah I think we did what we did at the time and it and it felt right Mm. there was never going to be enough time I always still have there's never you know there's never enough there was never enough time Mm. um you know, and he was quite poorly that year, particularly the last kind of four or five months, you know, actually sick and, and quite unwell. So, you know, the kind of quality of conversation isn't what it, yeah. you know, what it was yeah. even at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, like we, we were, yeah, we were with each other, you know, pretty mm. much, pretty much mm. all the time. Mm. You know, he worked like I, I, you know, I joke that he worked after diagnosis and stuff, but he was around, I was around, and we, you know, we just go for coffee and spend time together and, you know, just just be us and just just hang together, really, um, in between appointments and, you know, because literally just in, or in constant appointments, it feels like. Um, but I didn't want to be anywhere else. You know, I just wanted to be, just wanted to be with him really all the time. Yeah, I bet what about sort of at what point did it become obvious that he was going to die soon and and what did that look like for you in terms of the care you had to provide for him I think it was maybe only a, I don't do you know I just don't even know because because there was such a spiritual element to it I didn't want to ever give up hope mm. that things would change but I do remember having a conversation with him one day just like if you come back from this this is one hell of a story like (laughs) you know like I wouldn't put it past you Simon but you know wow (laughs) you're taking this one to the very limit um and 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 I mean even so so he was he was here the the whole time he was at home Mm. and um and then uh, we we had uh, the Macmillan nurses around and palliative care team, which were incredible. And that we'd we'd hatched a plan that he um, needed some fluids and would go to the hospice, get some fluids, maybe have a blood transfusion. But he was really reluctant. He said, "Well, I need to be home for Edith's birthday party, which was a Saturday." And this was like the, the Monday that we were hatching this plan. He's fine, I'll go in tomorrow, but I need to be home for Friday. And he said, don't keep me longer, otherwise I will discharge myself. You know, he was very much the author <laughs> of his, yeah. of what was going on. Yeah. And, you know, the care team were amazing and they were like, okay, like, but we think you need some fluids, you know, you lose it. He, he, he was, he was very, very skinny by then. And, 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 and I mean that, that last, those last 48 hours. So he was quite compassmentous that Monday morning. And then the last kind of 48 hours, he, he, he slowly kind of like we, sl- I sl- he stopped talking and he couldn't really move. A long story about getting him to the hospice and, and we got him there and he was there for 17 hours in the hospice and then he died. But I remember even getting to the hospice and just being like, no, no, no he's going to be okay. You just need to give him some fluids and mm. some um, blood and, and he's going to be home for Saturday to see this birthday party. Oh. And I remember the doctor just looking at me and, and taking me and his parents into a room and just being like, you need, we need to talk about his body is showing signs of ending. And I remember being like, oh, okay. It's, it's ending, it's finishing. Like mm. we've been on this, this, I don't know, like treadmill, I don't know. I was, mm. And I was like, it's, it's coming to an end. Mm. Is this, is this, is, is this going to be how it ends? And um, and he um, and they made us, you know, amazingly comfortable in the hospice. And and I and then I remember saying to them, "Do I need to get the kids here?" And they said, "Yeah, as soon as you can." And I was like, "Oh, okay. This is not long, then, is it?" I was like, "How long have we got?" And they're like, "As soon as possible." And I was like, oh, "Okay." So kind of like called, called school, called the child mind egg, just immobilized people literally i remember and it was pre-covid days so literally you know like his best friend i just te- i remember sending a picture of the address of where we were the hospice and i just said come now and like bang up the motorway you know and and within hours i was surrounded by like 
amazing friends and family. And so I was in bed, they'd made him really comfortable. The kids were around, we were playing music. Um, you know, we just, people came to say their goodbyes. Um, and, and I don't even know how much he knew was going on. I think he did. I think hearing the music he loved, mm -hmm. he loved, he loved music. He loved like dance music. And um, so there's a film with Ryan Gosling in called um, Drive. And he loved the soundtrack to Drive. And he, I mean, he planned his whole funeral, Simon. He, he said to me, oh, because he kept saying, oh, I'd like this song at my funeral if I die. I said, you need to write that down because I'm not going to be in any fit state to remember any of your requests. Yeah. He wrote the whole thing down. He wrote beginning, middle, end. If he'd written his own sermon in the middle, he could have done, you know. <laughs> and he said, I've just left it on the top shelf so that if anything happens, you know where it is. You know, and he, he, we played you know we played music together and and then I had a little sleep and and I and I kept thinking is he gonna die when I'm asleep but you know I just I couldn't keep my eyes open and I woke and then a couple of hours a couple of hours later he, he just started so pe like so pleased me his mum and me were there um and and um and and he and he passed away and the hospice were amazing you know they you know I asked questions you know, mm. how, how long have we got you know and they're like, well, we can't tell you exactly but things will these kind of things will change and that was helpful um and then and then going home I never slept that night just it was like if I don't sleep then it didn't happen you know then it's not the day you know mm. but then the next day friend came up and just I just slept I slept and slept and slept I can't tell you how much I slept after he died I just wanted to sleep Mm. Um, I was so tired and I think it was that it was that run of adrenaline you know from diagnosis day 13 months it was like go 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 you know you're in you know people talk about cancer being a battle which mm. I kind of really struggle with because then does that mean you've lost the battle and it's yeah. like, oh, mm. I don't know about that but mm. it was it, I was spent I was spent out exhausted mm. Um, but my go-to is to do more mm. and, um, yeah, be more and do more and distract more, you know, and go somewhere and do something, you know, get busy. Mm. Um, so I really had to kind of work on that. And then four months later, three months, yeah, four months later, lockdown happened. Mm -hmm. And it was all right, shut, shut up shop with for the long haul yeah and that that really changed me this uh, and I said to you when we previously chatted you know the solitude of uh the solitude of lockdown helped me heal because mm. I couldn't run away and mm. I couldn't go anywhere and I couldn't distract myself and I couldn't do this and do that and do the other I had to sit with it and I had to sit in my house and I had to be and yeah and hot and 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 feel it. Would you say that that is a necessary part of the grieving process, taking that time to learn to, to almost be comfortable with the uncomfortable and, and not try and distract, escape, avoid it? Um, I wouldn't have thought so, but I think because I had to, I think it is really necessary now. Mm. because I don't think I'd be the person I am today without that period that I had of solitude mm. and of and of rest and of recuperation and of healing and it and, and it brought to the surface all the anxiety mm -hmm. so although the, the the although the threat had now gone you know, the threat of Simon dying that was, you know, every hospital appointment, every scan, you know, every phone call from a doctor, every blood test, you know, we kind of had the worst news. So I don't know what we were, you know, kind of ever worried about, really. Um, but, but also the fear that he could literally drop dead in front of me because of, because of the pulmonary embolism. You know, I injected him twice a day for every single day from diagnosis you know it's just, just that kind of level of, of responsibility I suppose and I think the the threat had gone but I was still in such a highly anxious state yeah I was still 
worried and worry doesn't really cover it I was just still but you'd never know because I'm a really high functioning worried person Mm -hmm. I just can get on with stuff still but I look at photos now and I kind of was like wow you would never have known but you know I've got my lipstick on I've got my hair done I'm showered you know I'm I'm look fine but I'm like you know duck my legs are like going you know like crazy and and I and I got to a point uh, and I was experiencing so many flashbacks um so so the 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 pre the year that I was diagnosed I was you know you just have different experiences in terms of you know different scans and smells and just all sorts that is happening in that year and um I um was just having so many flashbacks you know I make a cup of tea and I you know just see stuff again or hear stuff again or just feel feel stuff again and it was and it was it was a really strange time because I just thought I'm not I why am I so anxious the 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 tra- you know the the threat's gone but the trauma the trauma is still so current in my day and this is maybe eight nine months after he died and I and and I thought I've got I've got to look into this I got Mm. classic me I was like I got I got I can't function like that I I've got to I've got to sort this out and um and it was also integrated with I was exercising loads so lockdown had happened and I was um exercising a lot to, to help my mental health which has always helped my mental health in massive ways um and and yet I was still I still had these like love handles like you know just yeah. just above your bum just there and I was like, but wait, I'm the fittest I've ever been. But yeah, I've, you know, what, like, what? And maybe it's time of life. Maybe it's just, you know, that's how my body is now. And then I got speaking to a friend and, um, and we talked about the adrenal glands and um, cortisol levels and everything being kind of like your, your body holding on to that fat because it's in such a high stress mm. level, such a high state of arousal. Mm. And I was like, I'm, I need to sort this out. I need to calm the flip down mm. because this is partly why I couldn't settle. Mm. So I, I really had to like force myself to rest and settle because because you're running on that adrenaline all the time. And um, I, I know I got, um, you know, different things aligned, don't they? And I and I got talking to a, a naturopath and um, we uh, and she we had a consultation. And she she talked about um we talked about nutrition and we talked about um the adrenal gland basically my adrenal gland being shot to pieces and that I was living in this high state of alert all the time and that my body was just not able to to basically let go of let go of that those fat stores and and kind of explained all the science around it and I was like I can understand that but how do I calm down how do I and and we talked about the reoccurring trauma basically and I, I and I was never diagnosed with PTSD and I don't necessarily feel like I need to have that as a diagnosis but definitely you know you're reliving in my mind's eye I'm a very visual person so I can relive things very very visually so we then um I then embarked on like a 12 week sessions with her weekly sessions with her to basically rewrite some of this trauma and that wasn't that was um it was new uh, neuro-linguistic planning um it's called and it's kind of like rewind therapy so you um, you look at the you look at the traumatic event again, and you um, basically take the like the toxic emotion out of it. So you can still see, I still remember stuff. I still you know like I still remember when he died, mm. but I'm not. It's not like emotionally traumatizing again. So I would you know relive him dying, relive the diagnosis. So an example I always use is um, it's always around this time because it's. Um, uh, fireworks so so I was diagnosed on fireworks night 2018 and I remember we were at the hospital and looking out over the city and there was loads of fireworks going off around the city and I remember just you know um and then we had a, I think we had a fireworks party um and and three weeks before he died we had a fireworks party and we had loads of friends and family and there was big fireworks in the park and um it was all just all just integrated around fireworks. Now I had a very good memory of fireworks, I had childhood memories, good memories of fireworks, and with Simon as well. And then now I've got this massive link of fireworks and the trauma attached to that. 
So on rolls 2019 and uh, all of a sudden I'm putting the kids to bed and I hear fireworks outside and I freeze and I'm literally like, I'm back in that place. I'm, I'm back three weeks before he died. I'm back on the diagnosis night and I'm ba- and all just flooded. I'm thinking I'm going to have a panic attack. And I'm like, I could just, I could just feel all my emotions running. So I was right in the middle of therapy at that time. So I took it to my therapist. I said, we've got to work through this. And we, we really were. And I mean, I, when I say I cried during those sessions, like it was like a deep, like mm. in the depths of my soul, working through that grief and trauma. And I um, was, we, we did a piece on around fireworks and I was kind of like, it's still, I think the jury for me was still out a little bit with this. I was like, is this just hocus pocus? Like, I'm not sure, but you know what? I need to give it a go because I can't do this every single year with fireworks mm. or whenever I see a firework, have this anxiety state. And so we, we did the piece of work and we reframed it, reshaped it, you know, put it, you know, put it in a bit more of a manageable place. Then that night I uh, had to take miles to Beavers and uh, he said, oh, mommy, there's a fireworks it's just way down the road. Can we go? And I was like, all right, let's test it out. <laughs> and I sat there and I watched the whole display and didn't get triggered. And I literally was like, I don't even know whether I fully understand this, but it just works. Yeah. Like it just works. I watched the display and I remembered specifically the happy memories that I had put in. And I can still acknowledge that, you know, diagnosed that night and I can still you know I'm not it's not amnesia no but I'm not traumatized about it and I suppose that's one of the one of the ways I can explain the kind of therapy that I had Mm -hmm. that it helped me process I mean we literally had a list of them I was like I'm gonna need a I've got you know it was like diagnosed you know I just had Mm. so many times that that needed working through Mm-hmm. But I was out, I was living it constantly. So in every one that we looked at and, and addressed was another one that I then could get more present day. Yeah. And I then didn't have to, you know, live in that high state of anxiety. So my, I just started to relax because I was not living in such a traumatic state anymore. I was way more relaxed. Yeah. Um, so I slept deeper. And I ate better. Um, I was calmer with the kids, so much calmer with the kids. Mm. Um, I could plan, I could problem solve again. I could, you know, just think a bit more clearly, not mm. reacting, but responding. Mm. Um, and just start to think, okay, what does my future look like? Mm. Like, this is not what I plan for. And this is not what Simon planned for, but mm. this is where we find ourselves and kind of regrouping really and kind of going, right, okay, what was that? I don't, I don't know, but okay, how are we going to, how are we going to start moving forward? What are we going to start doing? Mm. What's going to be good for us as a family of three, mm-hmm. you know? Um, Do you feel that in order to get to that point of thinking, what's next what do I want life to look like what do I want to create here you know being able to look forward maybe with a little bit of hope in your heart do you think you have to get to a point where you have done a lot of work with your grief that there's there's an there's an acceptance of where you're at in that moment before you can start to maybe look ahead a little bit yeah I think I had to sit with my grief Mm. and I mean, accept it. I'm, I mean, I've talked to you briefly about the Enneagram before, but I'm like an Enneagram three. If anyone knows what Enneagram stuff is, (laughs) don't look it up. It's really good. It's really helped me. I'm an Enneagram three, which basically kind of, um, means I'm quite goal orientated, very organized, very ambitious, you know, um, I look for validation uh, uh, through accomplishments and I'm very, you know, productive. And I think I, I almost, you know, almost kind of tackled my grief like that. I was like, right, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna need to grieve well, mm. like in order to 
I'm get, you know, so I had books about grief. I listened to podcasts about grief. And I listened to, you know, podcasts with uh, David, you speak to him, David Kessler. Oh, David Kessler, yes, yes, yeah. Listen to him in a podcast with Brené Brown. It's brilliant, isn't it, that podcast? That podcast is yeah. gold. I remember mm. listening to that in, in lockdown mm. while pottering around in the garden. I'm listening mm. to podcasts loads. I mm. plug myself in. The kids are doing whatever they're doing. And, and I, and I, and I, because I kind of like, I need to get, it's like I need to understand it so I can feel it. Yes. And it's like, if I, and I don't, I'm not very, I'm, I'm not a very wordy person. I kind of, oh, yeah, I mean, I can speak, <laughs> don't get me wrong. Um, but to, for me to listen to people really helps me kind of, yes, I understand that. And I can, and I can, and so, you know, different communities, like communities on, on Instagram, the grief community. I remember I came across um, Megan Devine, is it Megan Devine mm -hmm. on um, Refuge and Grief? And she just put things like dreading the weekend. And I was like, yes, I dread the weekend. Yeah. But I didn't know that I dreaded the weekend, but you've said it and I do. And thank you because I just thought I was not, I didn't almost think, you know, think that. And, and I suppose I, I, I've, I've needed to kind of like examine grief and understand grief and and like get my head around it in a way. Mm. And I'm still getting my head around it in a way. I mean, we're coming up to two years. And like I said to you, it's, I think the first five are the early days. Like mm. I'm early doors, mm. early doors. Mm -hmm. But equally, I knew that if I didn't, if I didn't get this, not straight in my head because it's not like oh it's all straight now we're fine now like if, if I didn't get this if I didn't have the therapy and I didn't get it you know sorted in my head this ship was going to go down yeah. and it was going to go down fast because yeah. because I think the responsibility of being solo parent I was like that's it the kids have only got me now yes they've got family and they've got friends and we are so loved and so supported but I was like I need to be the best version of me Mm. like for these kids like they've already lost one mm. they can't lose another mm. so you know the drive came from that for them mm -hmm. but equally I didn't want to live in this traumatic state I didn't want to live in a in this state of trauma I knew that I needed to live life because Sai talked about celebrating life and being alive and loving life and I was like how can I do that and I, and I can do that if I understand what I've been through and I can understand maybe a bit more about grief and what, understand myself more. So diving into the Enneagram, like, you know, jokes aside, it really made me though understand myself a bit more and just doing some personal growth stuff and reading about, you know, nutrition and listening on other podcasts. I, like I listen to Wrong and Chatterjee like mm. every week about sleep and about, um, you know, vitamins and kind of just being being the healthiest, wellest person I can be. Mm. And yeah, I still eat chocolate and drink gin. Like, absolutely. <laughs> <Good job. laughs> you know, but absolutely. But I, I don't know how long I'm going to be alive for. Mm. You know, we assumed we get old together, me and Zai, and live mm. happily ever after. Mm. And, then, and then he died. And I, nothing's guaranteed, is it? No. Nope. And I think there's something about the widow community that gets that mm. starkly. Mm. Um, and therefore, I suppose, you know, these last two years being in lockdown and also kind of coming out of it and stuff has, has been for me about who am I now? You know, I, I am a different person. I'm a different person, you know, 2018 Lisa to 2019 Lisa to 2020 Lisa is very different mm. you know a part of me died when Cy died mm -hmm. no doubt about it I'm changed fundamentally mm. you know, my, my soul's changed my core has changed I don't know whether my beliefs have changed I don't know what I, I, I ha have had to find who I am again without Simon at my side where I thought he was going to be you know asking those questions well what are my motivations now 
where do I want to go, be? Who do I want to be to my children? You know, and not answering all those questions at once, but just always making sure, just checking in with myself. You know, am I, am I honoring him through the life I'm living? You know, he, he, he was cross, he was dying. You know, he'd say, I want, I want to live. I want to see my kids grow up. And the thing is, is that I, you know, I say to myself, I, I didn't die. I've changed, but I didn't die. So therefore I have to live. So how can I live my, um, my, my best out in today? Because actually we only have today. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I don't know when I'm going to die. So I've only therefore got today. And you, you know, you have to equally be careful with that because there's a flip side where you could be like, right, let's just spend all my money and do everything, <laughs> you know, be wild. And you, you know, you can't just live for the day because you also need to live for mm. the future. But mm. it, it's getting that balance. And for me, it's surrounding myself with people, good friends, good family, checking things out with, you know is this a good idea for me to think about this or do this or, you know, just, you know, having, having some sounding boards so that I'm, I'm not going too far off piece Mm -hmm. um, in where I'm, you know, living this new, new life that's becoming my, my new normal, I suppose. I I find it really funny, you know, the whole lockdown coming out of lockdown, new normal and stuff. I'm like, well, this is a new normal anyway, because, because I died. So that, you know that was an old life kind of anyway yeah yeah, definitely and that's really hard I think it's really hard accommodating all those changes isn't it you know accepting that your life has changed accepting that you have changed your outlooks your beliefs um you know the, the things you want and we have so many big questions exactly like you say who am I what do I desire what do I want life to look like how do I go forward and make the best of this while still honoring my person you know how do I do that without the guilt the shame Mm. um the the sadness there's so much where do you even begin I mean what was your therapy (laughs) (laughs) go Go to therapy therapy. (laughs) go to therapy I say this basically to everybody all the time and but yeah from day from basically from diagnosis I went to therapy Mm. because because everybody, everybody is going through their, their grief. You know, parents, in-laws, brothers, you know, everybody. And so everybody's capacity is, is a little limited. But I, I used therapy. I knew it was an hour a week I had where it could all be about me. Mm. Yeah, it's important, right? <laughs> and I could bring anything to it. And to be able to have that uh, was so freeing, to be able to take that time. So I had kind of ongoing therapy from diagnosis to about a year after side eyes, so kind of, you know, pretty much two years. And then I had the like 12 weeks of really intensive, the trauma, the trauma work. And just to have that space to check in with myself and to to ask those questions and to just be held and to be listened and just to kind of explore. We talked a lot, lot about kind of like battle fatigue. So I remember that was, a, I couldn't understand why I was so tired. And we talked about that, that, you know, you're fighting, fighting, fighting. Adrenaline was over. Well, you know, shot to pieces, but I was just, you know, exhausted. Um, and just different things that we explored in that. Um, and, and I knew it was a safe place. I knew it wasn't going to go anywhere else. And I knew I could, I could sometimes I'd just go and just cry for an hour mm-hmm. and literally just wipe my tears and be like, okay, I'm good. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. and I'd cry at home, but it was different because, you know, you needed at home and your mummy and you're, yeah. you know, doing this and doing that and cooking and cleaning and, you know. And so I just knew that that hour was, was my hour to do what I needed to do. Yeah. Um, but I think I've always been quite a self-reflecting person. So I think I've always kind of, you know, journaled and wanted to, you know, sit with those difficult emotions at times, know that they'll pass, know that they'll change, know that they'll move. Getting out of my head really helps, which and doing that, I do that through exercise. So when, when I was diagnosed, one of the first things we did was join up 
join the gym. But so I was just like, well, if there's any any good time now, it'd be now, right? Okay. And you know, and he'd come and he'd sometimes do a couple of lengths or whatever. And but he knew that I needed it. I needed it to swim. So I'm always always been swimming, and um, and also just like yoga and body balance and kind of just moving. And I really found that integrating that into my week helped getting out of my head because I can't think of anything else when you're swimming or, or I pro- I'm more like a process when I swim actually but yoga and body balance I can't because really, you're focusing on what they're telling you mm. to do so, mm. so just having that headspace sometimes not um it's just it was just fundamental to me and I carried that on and it's n- non-negotiable for me it I've been poorly the last few weeks had covid and is not feeling myself at all and then I went back today and I was like oh there it is like yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I just did a few lengths sat in the sauna went to yoga and I'm like oh it's just just so much better because I'm because grief grief is in you it's in your bones it's in your body it's so um it's so painful and so moving for me Mm. helped massively Mm. in all the stages and continues to so I got a peloton bike set up when lockdown happened because I was like oh my gosh I can't exercise (laughs) like because I stopped the swimming pool was closed I was like hey how can I exercise okay well I can set up a bike up so I set up Simon's bike in the front room on rollers and was just like hey well at least I can always move you know and um and just continued that because for me it's not a choice I can't I can't do it based on my feelings because I can't uh, I can't always I can't always trust that my feelings are necessarily feeling the, the good for me because sometimes mm. they're just they feel they feel what they feel don't they say so I just stop making decisions based on my feelings I'd make a decision not even based on motivation it's a decision that I will exercise three, four times a week because I know it's good for me mm. and I know it helps me. So why? Yeah. And I think that's a really interesting point, isn't it? Because I think we have to, we have to build integrity with our word, essentially, you, you know, and I think when we're grieving, when we're in the, the depths of despair, I mean, that, that physical pain, there's so much that stops us from doing the things that we know will help us. You, you know, a lot of us know what we need to do what will help us but knowing and doing are two very different things Mm -hmm. and our feelings get in the way we wake up we feel heavy we feel sad we're exhausted because grief is exhausting there's no escape from it and 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 then there's that well why what's the point why should I bother I I can't be bothered and the, the, the want the desire the drive isn't there because you just you can't and especially when you first start you know and you first go and get some exercise there's that oh okay well it doesn't really feel any better you you know it's like it's an investment of time isn't it that you have to kind of really be present in and and it doesn't have to be a peloton bike you know you don't have to go swimming even you can go for a brisk walk out in nature it doesn't even have to cost you anything um but to physically move your body have something to focus on you you know release those stress hormones and 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 increase those feel-good hormones it helps us you know, it's scientifically proven to help us with, with our yeah. grief. There's no argument about it. But like you say, doing it is is difficult when we don't want to do it, when we're tired. And so we yeah. have to almost make that promise to ourselves because we're, we're never going to feel motivated to do totally. it. And, but that's why I never I never exercise in the evenings. Mm. I exercise first thing in the morning. Because mm-hmm. if I wait to the evening, oh, I've got all, the, all these pieces under the sun. Ditto. <laughs> I've talked myself out of it by 10 o'clock. <laughs> I've spent all day talking myself out of it. <laughs> so it's wake up, gym stuff, kids mm. get breakfast, I go on the bike, you know, it's, and then you sit down at your computer for nine o'clock and you've already smoked for the day because you've yeah. already done a yeah Workout. Workout. yeah <laughs> you know, it, and and I think it's again it, it doesn't make sense to me so I needed to kind of understand the science behind it and understand you know so listening to podcasts about all the benefits of um mm. exercise to kind of convince myself like I know mm. it's good but I also need to know to know to know to know to know to know that it's, it's good for me yeah um 
and yeah that it, it's it helps me in, in all, all in so many ways I mean I've never been one for exercise um and it was only after Simon died that I discovered exercise and and I genuinely can't live without it now you know it, it keeps me sane it helps me with my mindset, physically, mentally, emotionally, all of it, you, yeah. you know, it's, it's my time. And I think we have to, we have to keep exposing ourselves to things that motivate us, inspire us, instill hope in us, you know, and podcasts are a great, great way of doing that, aren't they? And for me to go out and exercise and listen to a podcast, you know, there's so many, and they don't always have to be about grief because we can get really bogged down with grief. You know, people often say to me that what are the podcasts I can listen to and what are the books I can read? And then they come back a few weeks later, like I'm a bit griefed out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I get it. And it's like, there's only so much you can take. Um, <laughs> But there's so many personal development podcasts and books and shows, YouTubes, all sorts out there. And I think in as much as you can, you, you know, submerge yourself in that and keep repeating the things that you, you need to keep doing, it eventually it sinks into our subconscious and it, it becomes our, our reality almost, you know. Yeah. And I think, like you say, you just have to keep exposing yourself to that world. Yeah. to those belief systems so that it becomes ingrained so that you deeply understand it and it's not just something you've heard and thought oh yeah that sounds good and then just yeah. carried on doing what you always yeah. do which doesn't help you can definitely be flaky you can definitely mm -hmm. be like oh I'm gonna go all you know all yeah. out motivated for two weeks to run yeah but you've got to do it when you're not motivated as well and um, that's the difference isn't it yeah, and I think that, you know, that's the thing, there's, non, there's non-negotiables in my life mm. that I know are kind of like my foundations, my mm. kind of scaffolding that holds me up. For me, mm. it's food, good food, mm. um, sleep. If mm. I have not slept, it mm. all goes downhill very quickly in my head. Yeah. Um, so having babies was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, yeah, food, sleep for me and exercise which is like oh yeah of course because everyone you know that the trio kind of thing but it's like mm. yeah no it is mm. that simple actually like yeah. though for me for the from just for me those foundations are those foundations are are set I'm mm. I'm much nicer person to be around yeah um, and and I much prefer myself to be mm. around myself <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, is that something you noticed in, in your grief? Because, you know, I, I, I say all the time, I just think we're so ill-equipped to deal with grief. We know nothing about it. Our, our expectations around it are, are ridiculous. Um, we give ourselves a really hard time. Did you notice yourself giving yourself a hard time? You, you know, your internal dialogue, your inner critic, what, what was that like for you in, in, in the depths of, of grief? And how did you go about I, I don't know not, not fighting it but it, yeah it, I would say it was that moment where I reached out to have have the the trauma therapy actually because in my head I was like I am so anxious yet the yet the threat's gone why mm. are you so anxious Lisa like calm down like mm. just quite you know quite crit like critical come on you should you yeah. should should you yeah know? yeah um, yes the worst happened but you know, you should be okay. Yeah. What, like eight months in, like my expectations of myself can be extraordinary. Yeah. Even now, you know, people have to say to me, yeah, but like, what, why, why should you, should you be okay with that? Is yeah. this still really hard? I'm like, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. You know, and I think it was at that, that point I knew I needed extra help here because yeah. I thought this is this is not going this is growing this is mushrooming yeah this is impacting on how I'm parenting mm. this is impacting on relationships this is impacting on my just my con in my head just constantly yeah. just constantly you know because you're seeing things again and the trauma and the flashbacks and the way I'm interacting with people but you wouldn't necessarily have known like as well like I kind of can hold it together but I think what's lovely is 
you notice yeah. it doesn't really I, matter what other people yeah. see or, or or perceive of your reality I wasn't happy you weren't happy but you were aware of that and you were noticing what was going on for you what was showing up how mm-hmm. you were feeling and how that was impacting your life and I just think so many of us are not aware I mean I certainly wasn't until I started on my journey you, you know you kept you get on the hamster wheel of life and you just you just keep doing the things you've always done because you don't know any differently and you you don't really fully understand what's going on for you in that moment and it is just stopping for a minute and thinking what am I doing what am I thinking what am I feeling mm-hmm. and how am I you, you know reacting to this because often a lot of the time we are reacting we're not responding yeah and it's in that, isn't it? And I think you clearly have a very high level of, of self-awareness, which has stood you in great stead in, mm. in, through your grieving journey because you're able to take stock a little mm. bit. Yeah. Um, and I truly believe that's the fundamentals of any change is, is, mm. is that awareness because without it, how do we know what we're changing? How do we know yeah. what we're doing? We, we can't, you know, and we, we don't know where to start if we don't know where we're at in that time. I just, I just knew I didn't want to live like this. Yes. And I just was like, well, if you don't want to live like this, you're going to have to do something about yes. it. Yes, yes. And that's a hard realisation to come to. Mm. Really hard. I think that that understanding, this is on me, actually. Mm. I, I can't spend all my money and make us happy. We can't just move mm. house or I can't just yep. find another partner and get married and it'll all be okay. Yep. It's, it's like, you, you know, there's these... loads of things. Mm. And, and lockdown saved me from doing that because I couldn't. Yeah. But I could see myself as like, okay, where can I go on holiday? How can I spend money? Should I buy any cars? You know, just going through my head, like, yeah. hey, what can I do? You know, what can I do? Spend, spend, spend. Yeah. Knowing, knowing that it would feel good for a minute. And then I'm yeah. like, oh. you know, yeah. because I, yeah. I know that the connection's not there. Yeah. And, and I just, yeah, totally that. Just, just, I just remember thinking, this will go one of two ways. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you do have a choice in this Mm. there is help and it was Mm. driven by my weight which was interesting because I wasn't overweight but Mm. just annoyed that I still had these yeah muffin tops yeah kind of I went with the pretense of that because that felt kind of safe and acceptable yeah and then and then when you know we we untook that layer off it was never then about the way yeah I lost inches that's lovely that was great but my gosh, I was calmer. Yeah, definitely. And I was more yeah. connected with my yeah. kids and I was mm. less, just less stressed. And I think that is just one of the biggest, uh, for me, it was one of the biggest realizations, wake up calls, whatever, you, you know, that understanding if you want everything in your life to feel better. And, and it's, it's always looking for those external kind of options of how can I make my life better what can I do what can I buy where can I go and it's understanding we've got to go within we've got we've got to invest in us we've got to dive deep you know and and really and when we invest in us when we make the inside better Mm -hmm. everything on the outside just naturally becomes better we start to make better choices Mm -hmm. you know we find clarity and and we understand ourselves and what we desire what makes us tick what doesn't and that just leads us down a path that's more aligned with who we Mm -hmm. are and and feels more fulfilling but it's not what we do naturally, is it? Is invest in ourselves and and give ourselves an hour a week where we can go and cry and be heard and be seen and have our grief witnessed mm-hmm. without being judged, without being bright sided, you, you know, or somebody kind of feeling desperately uncomfortable, not knowing what to say. It's it's kind of that that space is just, I think, so vital in our healing journeys. You know, creating that that space for ourselves. Yeah because we're worth it we're absolutely worth it because the, the worst has happened mm-hmm. the very worst has happened mm-hmm. so it, it requires that acknowledgement mm. and that things are never going to be the same again no never never ever and that's hard <laughs> and, and and it how how do we go forward mm. with that how Mm. how do I now live when everything I ever knew is not as it was Mm. you know so it it and it will be a life's work yeah and that's 
I truly believe that because it's because grief shows up mm-hmm. still shows up I'm not traumatized anymore but grief is still present so grief is in you know the uh, the graduation from preschool mm. he's not standing next to me mm. it's in the Christmas day mm. it's in it's in the garden when I it's on me to do the gardening it's in it's in in everything because he's he's still here he's still present mm. in our thoughts in our conversations in 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 our photos in our you know in our discussions but it's how you have a relationship now with with your person although they're not here mm-hmm. isn't it mm-hmm. it's it, absolutely and how do you do that how have you sort of integrated you, you, the loss of Simon into your future how are you honoring Simon you, you know and taking him forward with you I suppose I will talk about him at any opportunity mm. I, you know I think it's funny this kind of coming out of lockdown and people are like you know oh there she is you yeah. know is yeah. she okay yeah. um, and 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 I like to be the kind of first who says his name because yeah. then then it's like oh okay, okay yeah okay. yeah um, I, I, we, we talk about him a lot as a family, which I think helps and mm. around the kids talk daily with, about him with the kids and play music and, um, and just honor, honor him, honor him around the, around the dates as well. Obviously we're coming up to the second anniversary. I don't know. There's, there's just... Just, I suppose, keeping, still keeping him, keeping, yeah, he's still present. He's still talked about. He's still there. He's still, still you know, he's still there. He still influences me. Yeah. You know, I will often be like, what does Simon say about this? Yeah. (laughs) You know, because he was so wise. And uh, or I'll ask friends, what do you think Simon would think about this? Because that would really help me, especially those early, early days. Yeah. When I couldn't make a flipping decision about mm. toast, like I just mm. couldn't make a decision, and things have expanded on that. You know, I can make I, I, I can make decisions now, mm. which, which help. Um, but you know, it's not. We grew up together. We were together so young. Mm. We had such like fundamental ten years of our lives together. You know the impact he had on my life, you know, it's profound. I am the person I am today Mm. because of him. And I will always be that way because of him. Yeah. And, you know, and I think with the kids, you know, that he, he's, he's there in front of me Mm. in them, Mm -hmm. even weird things like Miles will rub his eyes in certain ways, like I did. And I see it and I'm like, like astounded sometimes yeah but we yeah I suppose we just we honor him we honor him in in never never letting it go quiet around him about him you know there's always there's always a freedom that we can talk about daddy Mm -hmm. we can talk about Simon um in old and in new relationships and friendships we can talk about him yeah it's so important, isn't it? And I think, you know, as much as you said earlier, part of us dies with them. It does. You, mm. you know, there's no escaping that. We are forever changed. But there's also a part of them that lives on in us. You, yeah. you know, I think we do carry them. Um, they come with us on our journeys. They they have shaped the person we've become. We, we are who we are because they've been in our lives and, yeah. and they've, you know, helped us form create the person that that we are now and and they they form our decisions moving forwards you know um and and sometimes it can be again sometimes you can go against them you you know like the decisions you make I remember always remember Simon wouldn't ever let me have fitted wardrobes in our bedroom and then when he died I was like I'm having fitted wardrobes (laughs) so um, Simon was fake flowers he hated (laughs) fake flowers and uh, yeah, I've got plenty of fake flowers because I'm just like, I really like them. 
<laughs> That's so funny. But it's true, isn't it? It doesn't always have to be they form our decisions in a way that we would do what they would do all the time. We can kind of have our, we can kind of go, do you know what? I'm yeah. doing my own thing. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. listen, I'm going to buy the flowers. <laughs> exactly. I'm doing it. I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, but I think this has just been a, a wonderful, wonderful conversation. It really has. Um, you have offered so much, so much, Lisa. It's been so inspiring and thought provoking. And you've offered so much wisdom and, and strength for people. So thank you so much. Do you have one little piece of advice that you would say to somebody struggling right now in, in their journey? I would say it won't always feel like this. Mm. which is a bit cliche I appreciate that but it's true but my gosh it is true mm. and I really I can only believe that it's true because I've lived it yeah there were points where I was like wow is yeah. this it forever yeah because yeah. um, if it is I'm not sure I'm gonna be okay mm. with that mm. absolutely <laughs> but acknowledging it and acknowledging it holding it holding the space for it and knowing that literally nothing lasts forever mm. not just so so neither can this emotion and neither can this feeling yeah. and neither can this but oddly you will miss this as well mm. because there was a rawness in the beginning that makes you feel super close, I think, yeah. to your significant, that then you oddly miss mm. again yeah. because yeah. you're not, um, yeah. it's not as raw. Yeah. And so, although it's suffocating, it will pass. You will, you will change, move, grow because nothing stays the same. And, and I think, you know, spring comes again. I always yeah. love putting bulbs in at mm. this time of year. Get your bulbs in now. You know, yeah. it's a cracking time of year. Yeah. And because it gives you hope. I remember putting the bulbs in that year and just being like, I don't know when I'm going to see these again. I, we after Christmas. I don't know what my life will look like, but they will come up. Yeah. They, ju they just will because that's what happens um, in nature around us. And so that can be reflected back onto us, can't it? Yeah. That things will change and grow again. Um, yeah. And so, so that's why I just say, kind of hold, hold tight. Yeah. <laughs> it cannot, and yes. it will not last forever. Yeah. Um, Very true. And get your bulbs in. <laughs> Absolutely. Get your bulbs in. Bless you, Lisa. That is wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Lovely. And I will speak to you again very soon. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Take care.